Hello there, fellow Dune smugglers, Radamon here. Thank you for tuning in to the very first episode of Dune Spice Wars, where I play the smugglers, and this will also act as a tutorial to the game. So Dune Spice Wars is a 4X real-time strategy game set in the Dune universe, where you must lead your faction and battle for control and dominance over the uh, harsh desert planet of Arrakis. This will be a tutorial stream. What I'm planning on doing is perhaps doing one tutorial session and then one where there's more user feedback uh, and I play a little bit faster. Uh, so the tutorial part, I will be minimizing viewer suggestions, but also uh, the app that I use for polling you all anyway is broken, so that kind of works perfectly. I did poll ahead of time about what faction to play, and the winning faction choice was Smugglers. So I'll cover what all four factions, and there are planned fa uh, additional factions in the future, but what all four factions are, what they're good at, what they're weak at, uh, and I'll be playing on a normal difficulty on default map settings, which is medium, and I'll show you that as well. Uh, music. I love you, but you're still overpowering my eardrums, despite the fact that you are at, like... Like, nothing. You're at whatever 30% of 30% is. So, there are four factions right now. House Atreides, House Harkonnen, the Smugglers, and the Fremen. Uh, I'm going to briefly summarize these, but basically each faction is... The, the first three factions are very similar to one another. The Fremen play a bit differently. Um, there's a lot of game mechanics that make the Fremen a little bit more unique. I would also say that they're probably more challenging to play. But uh, House Atreides is a faction where you generally have the best reputation with um, the Lestran, and you have the best or Lestrade, rather, and you have the best... You you can use your um, sort of honor to peacefully annex territories. Uh, House Harkonnen is more about oppression and dominance. Uh, they also have a pretty good relation with Lestrade, but they use troops to produce... to oppress their colonies and produce more resources, and um, they can use their oppression ability to force colonies to make more resources. Uh, the Smugglers is more about spying and black market deals. So they'll have improved interactions with the Arrakis black market, and then also they can install underworld headquarters in opponents' uh, villages and HQs, which is a really good way to Trojan horse for a, for a win. And then there's the Fremen. The Fremen are probably best at avoiding dune worms. So they harvest spice in a, in a very different way than the other three houses and are immune to having their spice harvesters destroyed. Um, they are better at uh, traveling through the deserts and surviving and not um, suffering supply loss. One of the mechanics in this game is uh, there are certain areas of the map that are very dangerous for your troops to travel into because it's so dry and harsh that troops will normally die. They will succumb to the environment, and the Fremen can survive that a little bit better. And um, I would say the real weakness is um, the movement speed of their troops. Uh, the other three factions can use transport uh, planes or flying transports to move the troops around, and the Fremen have to ride worms, and it's very difficult to use that properly and well and often. Uh, so they can, the Fremen can be out micromanaged pretty aggressively, although their individual combat units are pretty strong. Holy cow, Kadath, thanks for all the gifted subs. So we did say that we're going to go and become the smugglers, and I'll catch up with the activity feed in just a second. So, uh, the smugglers have different faction bonuses. Uh, sort of your, there is a, a way to measure how successful you are called hegemony. Uh, and as your hegemony goes up, and this is for all the factions that you're playing against, you unlock extra things. So at 5k, you unlock extra contraband special events and more votes in Lestrade, and this will make more sense once I start playing. And then at 10k, uh, you know their main base districts, and you can also build an underworld headquarters at their main base, which is a very powerful tool. Um, at the start of every game, you're also offered the pick of two of four counselors. So these counselors provide uh, unique bonuses 
so that there's a little bit of replayability. I wouldn't say that these counselors make a significant difference in terms of gameplay. It's just tiny little bonuses here or there, so I'll show you them. Uh, Banerjee, so gain 30% more when pillaging a village and gain plus creep when pulling a village. Uh, all of this will make more sense when I get into the gameplay. Uh, I have also, I want to say, I was never really a reader of Dune, and all of the pronunciations of terminologies and names, I am going to screw up and I don't really care. It doesn't really matter as far as gameplay mechanics go. So this, this counselor here uh, allows their agents, their spies, to have merchant traits, and infiltration levels can't be lower than one, so that you can infiltrate more uh, different factions and governmental organizations more effectively. Uh, reduces the authority cost to annex a village, depending on the available water. This is probably one I'm going to choose. And reduces the cost to install uh, headquarters, underworld headquarters, depending on the available water. Uh, water is a resource in the game that when you have, it, it, it's required to be able to expand your territory uh, and it's required to be able to have troops and all of that stuff. So water is very, very important. So someone that has a reduction in authority with available water, if you hoard the water, uh, you'll be able to annex a lot of territories. So a really good expansion counselor. And then the last one, underworld headquarters produce extra currency, Solari. Um, Solari is kind of like money. And Plazcrete is more like building materials. You can think of it that, that way. And also gives influence for Underworld uh, Headquarters. This counselor would be really late game counselor. It would be a good counselor to have in a big map. But I'm not going to be playing on a big map. So I think I'm going to go with Banerjee and Lingar. And then down here, you can customize the types of games you have. And I know my overlay is a little bit in the way. So let me hide it. Uh, map, medium. Sam Warren, act Sam Warren activity normal, storm normal, siege hostility normal, victories all will be enabled, domination camp disabled, but hegemony, hegemony is the win condition where you reach 30k and uh, you just win, and then political is uh, when you become the governor and there is a timer. Once you become governor, uh, you can be unseated after 30 minutes, but if you're not, you win. And then there is also the possibility of assassinating uh, the leaders of the other factions. And that's probably going to be the route I attempt to take with the smugglers because it's most fitting with the smugglers. But that actually takes a considerable effort and setup time. Uh, you can also pick the AI players here and then the difficulty. So it goes down to easy, goes up to insane. I've beaten the game on insane, uh, but for the sake of this tutorial, I'm going to play on medium. Here we go. Let me get that UI back. So I do have the tutorials on, uh, but the, tor the, the tutorials, I would say, don't really cover very much of the gameplay. So I'm going to be going into a deep dive of gameplay, which means I'm going to be playing slow and methodically and explaining everything as I go. So before I even unpause, let me explain the UI elements. Uh, up here is the leader, which you can see your amount of hegemony and the other factions. Uh, in this UI, you can see the hegemony. You can also see the Lestrade standing. The higher your standing is, um, the more votes you are get going to get for the periodic um, events that happen. And again, this will make more sense once you see the first Lestrade um, council. And then also the relation level. Now, what's interesting about this game is you can become really friendly and ally with other factions, but ultimately you only really win by either wiping them out or being the strongest. So I would say that allying other factions in this game is really weak uh, compared to other games. There is no concept of a faction win or an alliance win or a cooperative win or anything like that. Uh, then you can also see your council members up here. It's just a reminder of what you picked. Uh, here is how much spice you're producing. And... The way this works is the spice that you produce, you can either stockpile to pay taxes or you can sell it to Chome for Solari, which is currency. And then periodically you have to bribe the Imperium. So the next bribe I have is 80 spice in 25 days. And if you bribe the Imperium, you get bonuses. And if you don't bribe the Imperium, you get penalties. So... Generally speaking, I find it uh, worthwhile to bribe the Imperium. 
And then above here, you have the spice report, which is, you know, what is the exchange rate of spice to Solari and what is the bribe level and, you know, all that junk. I barely ever use spice report. And then we have currency. So you have Solari, which is the official currency of the Imperium and Plasgri, which is the versatile building material. Then you have manpower. Manpower is used for things like recruiting units or recruiting spice collection teams or setting up missile batteries and, and military bases, that kind of thing. Uh, then the next currency is fuel cells. Fuel cells are used to build air bases and uh, little scout choppers, the ornithopter. Um, Fremen don't have fuel cells. They, they don't make use of fuel cells at all. Uh, then you have water. Water is essential for life and it's needed to control villages and have troops and if you go into the negative of water you get unrest and rebellions and then authority authority is your ability to annex territories more or less it's used in some other ways but generally speaking authority is just for the annexation of territory up here is again the hegemony and it gives you a breakdown of how you've earned that hegemony so mine is zero because i haven't done anything this is the current date and then the pause resume, options menu, and then it can also go up to three speed. Uh, so I generally, I think I'm gonna be playing on one speed, but you know, it goes up. Also, there's a lot of events where you're gonna find yourself pausing. So I could do a no pause, but I'm gonna be pausing often. Uh, for instance, when my, my spice harvesters are under attack by a dune worm, I'm gonna pause and recall them. Um, up here is the three other houses that I'm against, and you can click them to start trades greetings i will say generally speaking any trade that the ai proposes automatically is really really crummy i've never really seen a fair trade so they're gonna go oh give me 50 plascrete for like 500 solari and you're like that's a horrible exchange rate so if when you're offered trade from other factions don't necessarily take it counter offer it's probably smarter um but yeah you can form research agreements trade agreements and non-aggression packs. But like I said, I think the diplomacy in this game is pretty weak. Uh, there's no diplomatic wins. So I generally pretty much ignore the other factions and try to kill them off. Uh, below that, you have operations. This will make more sense once I have spies, but that's probably the part and parcel, the very important part of being a smuggler. So we'll be using a lot of that. Uh, there's a research tree, but I'm not gonna get that until I have my first village. There is the Lestrade Council and that's going to kick off in 20 days and then there is espionage and i'm not going to have my first spy for a bit uh, then you have this ornithopter and they are not possible to destroy uh, they're immune to attacks or whatever so you can send them all around there is an auto recon option but i would say don't turn that on until like middle game because there is some really smart places for you to recon and really dumb places for you to recon all right, down here uh, in the rest of the UI, you have the siege that I have, which is your base. If it's destroyed, you lose. And your base also can build special districts, which is unlocked to 2000 hegemony. And those districts are super powerful. So trying to push to 2000 hegemony is really important. And cheers. All right, uh, with that out of the way, the first thing that you probably want to do is send your scout out to the closest spice field. And that's actually exactly what the tutorial is going to say. So I do have the tutorial enabled to show you the tutorial and show you what it tells you and what it doesn't. The tutorial won't really tell you about strategy or tactics or any of that. Barely even touches upon game mechanics. All it really does is like shove you out the door. So obviously I'm here to replace what it doesn't do. So it's telling me to go recon a village next to a spice field. Another thing is when you zoom out, you can see the entire map. So this sort of black hashed gray out here is out of bounds. So I am sort of northeast of center. Um, and you can see here, I'm headed to this region and you use authority to annex regions. Now there's other special districts, every region uh, specializes in something. So this region is a spice region and it might have some other bonuses. On every map, there is a middle region which has a uh, the possibility of building a well. And then there is going to be other randomized special regions that offer you hegemony or resources or bonus resource production around the map. So a lot of this game is about 
positioning your regions, annexing, sort of like a dune monopoly of sorts. So let's get started. And before I even pause, I also want to recruit a scavenger and a wrecker. Uh, but maybe I should show them first, and you can just right-click to refund. So scavenger is basically a melee unit. Uh, it costs solari, it costs manpower, it costs water, it costs um, military command points. So there is a finite amount of command points that you have. You can't go over your command point cap without incurring some serious penalties. So there's a finite amount of troops that you can use. And your scavenger here gains additional health regeneration per day at the end of combat whenever an enemy unit dies nearby. So they recover after battle quick. And then wreckers here uh, deal damage to drain supply of enemy units and uh, also do a little bit of AoE. So I'm going to recruit one of each and send my scout, my recon, out to the spice field. What? The first thing I'm probably going to want to do is to recon all of the adjacent districts to my home siege. Because those are going to be the cheapest to annex in terms of territory. And you definitely want to spend your authority well. So I have this region here, the False Wall South. But I'm not going there. I'm going out to the spice. So here we go. Here's a spice field. And the western part of this region has the field. So the right part of the region is going to have the village. Now, the village is here. I know from experience because villages are almost always, not always, but almost always built on um, sort of rocky terrain. Which brings me to another game mechanic. Uh, there are essentially three types of terrain in this game. There are this rocky terrain which makes you immune to dune worms. When you're on the soft sand, dune worms can attack you, and you will be warned that they're going to attack you, and you have time to try to get to harder surfaces, or to chopper out or something. Uh, and then the third type of terrain is um, what is called like deep desert, and it's a terrain that will absolutely sap you of your water, and you will die if you try to traverse it. So although it doesn't look like a terrain barrier, walking across it is basically suicide. So this is the Cave of Riches region. And my chopper is going to recon this village. And then as soon as it does... Oh, ALS Gamer with a whole lot of gifted subs too. Cheers. Cheers to you both. Cheers to all of you. There's a whole lot of gifted subs up in the uh, activity feed. So, another thing to look at is the other factions here are going to be like here, 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 right? So, this area back here, which is near the edge of the map, is kind of mine. I don't necessarily need to annex it uh, right away because it's not going to be easy for enemies to contest it. And all once you have a better baseline and understanding of the game, I'll start to explain some strategies and tactics, higher level stuff that obviously isn't going to be covered in a tutorial ways to win. Hello. So here we go. We have got the melee, the scavenger, and the range, the wrecker, and I'm going to send them up to this village. So here's the village, and it's guarded by two ranged militia that I'm going to have to kill in order to annex Harasek, or Harasek, or whatever it's called. And then the region bonus is Way of the Desert. Uh, experience gain for all of my military units go up by 20% in this region. So, my troops will level up faster when they kill things in the Harasek region. Alright, this Ornithopter, I'm also going to send to adjacent tiles. Or however you pronounce it. And here's another one. Aral Basin. Now, other region specifics is wind strength. Wind strength allows you to harvest water on the wind. So, the higher the wind strength, the better. Uh, regions that you can annex will range generally between two and six wind strength. There is a few regions with one wind strength. And then there are some regions with 10 and 20 wind strength, but they're not annexable. They are the deep desert and they will kill you. And you can't own them or control them. So this region here is a wind strength of two. Kind of sucks. Kind of sucks. However, when you remember that I reduce my authority cost to annex villages based upon the available water, regardless of the wind strength, it is probably, due to my counselor, ideal for me to try to produce as much water as possible. Because if I do that, 
um, I will be able to annex new villages more cheaply. So if we take a look at the village here, this village annex to annex it will cost me five water out of the 14 that I have. I started with 20 and my armies took up six of it. And then if I add this village, it takes up another five, my water goes down to nine. Um, and then here is the annexation cost. And you can see it has a base cost of 20, a distance from my main base of 14, which is 34. And then because of the amount of water that I have, it's a minus one from 34 to 33. So if I'm able to hoard a lot of water, I'll be able to gobble up a lot of territories. So with that in mind, uh, being a veteran player, I know that it's really gonna be in my best interest to push for the center of the map quickly to try to get that precious well, because that well provides a lot more water than any other individual district will. And uh, Ruburn and uh, PS Sipol, thank you for the follow and the sub. Zaibatsu for the resub. Uh, Glitch for more bits, and Kelly and Ruskin for gifted subs. All right, so now that I'm here, uh, other things to notice is some of my troops, they have health and they have supply. So supply is resupplied when you are near an ally village or in your own territory. But because I just walked across this region here, my supply went down to 71 and 60. And when your supply hits zero, your troop will start to dehydrate to death. They will die if they're not resupplied. So that's really important to note. It's It can be very dangerous to travel long distances without the ability to resupply, which means that territory deep within, regions deep within your own territory are basically immune to enemy attacks because there's nearly no way for them to get to those regions alive. They will run out of water because of supplies, um, all right, so let's kick off the first fight at Harrisat. Oh, yes. So here we go. Uh, these rangers here, these are armed civilians that panic when their health is under 50%, and they are not very good in melee combat. So when my scavenger runs up to them, they will start to do reduced damage to me. So here, as you can see, they're contaminated due to my ranged unit where their supply drain increases Generally speaking, you're not going to kill enemy units with uh, with your wreckers contaminating supplies. It's possible, but it's unlikely. And then, of course, they're also pinned down. All right. And here we found another town. And this town, ooh, is really good. It, The region here specializes in scientists, which unlocks new technology. So it allows me to build two research hubs and it produces 30% more research for the hubs that I build here, which is very, very powerful if I can afford to construct those buildings. Cheers. I very much like starting next to this region. And then this region also has Plascrete minerals. So any Plascrete factory that I build here will have an increase of 50% more minerals made. So as, as you can see, my Plascrete income right now is 20. A typical Plas Plascrete factory will make you 30. Uh, this region will make me 45. So this region would be really good for me to head to next because of its bonus in scientists and its availability of minerals. I did mention that I really want to push to the center, but that doesn't necessarily mean I should ignore the rich zones that are adjacent yes. to my home, because they are, as you can see, cheapest to annex. Yes, boss. The further out from your your home siege you go, the more expensive it becomes. So this region here has really high wind strength, which means it will produce a lot of water if I build a water production building here. And I will start analyzing it for what it is specialized in. What's next? And you can also hold shift to queue up uh, to queue up moves. So I just queued up this recon to scout this, which is the village, scout this, which is likely the resource that this region has, and then to head to the next tile over. All right, getting started. Yes, I have found a village which controls spice. Now that we have killed off the militia at Harasek, I can take control of this village. Now, normally you get multiple options. You'll be able to take control of it, you'll be able to pillage it, and if it belongs to an enemy, you'll be able to liberate it. 
But for your first village, you're kind of forced to take control, which is fine because I was going to anyway. Boom. Take control. So now that I'm taking control, I, as you can see up here, annexation minus five water. And then I used some of my authority, 33 of it, in order to take control of this village. So authority is a very important resource to build up and use wisely uh, because it is your ability to add new territories. Yes. All right, so this village here has extra manpower, which is good. It cost me 47 authority uh, because it's a little bit further from my home siege compared to like 34. And we'll figure out what its resource is. So, when you are taking control of a city, if any enemy unit comes within the blue circle you see here, and of course the circle will be colored by the color of your faction, uh, you will end up, it will end up being contested, and you have to either kill them off or push them out for you to continue. So, for instance, if an enemy is trying to take control or pillage or liberate your cities, all you really have to do is put a foot inside this circle. With that said, they're gonna try to kill you. But that's how to stop the clock for contesting. And then, once you push them out of that circle, this little progress bar here will start to drop. So just because they've gotten pushed out of that circle doesn't necessarily mean it's not gonna be contained. They still have like a few minutes to get back in that circle. Uh, kind of like King of the Hill or something like that. But that's how that game mechanic works. All right, so now it's telling me in the tutorial that I need two military units and control a village with a spice field. So I have my two military units and I'm about to control a village with the spice field, which is over here. Done. All right, now that I control my first village, I've unlocked a whole lot of additional options. Um, up here is your sort of news feed. So here it's saying that I had an ongoing siege, but it has now been resolved. I now control a new village and I now unlocked the research tree. So here's the research tree. You have four main types of researches. You've got uh, your spying research, your economy, or your, um, uh, what would this be? This is a sort of a mix of society research, economy research, military research. Uh, generally speaking, what I like to do at the start of the game in terms of the research tree, oh, and I'm missing part of my overlay, there we go, is to get local dialect studies, but I'll show you the four options. So this reduces the amount of authority it costs to annex a new village. So it allows me to expand a little bit more quickly, which is really important. You know, he who controls the uh, territory controls the spice. Intelligence network allows your agents that are assigned to... Choman Infiltration or Lestrade, uh, Lans Lansrad in Infiltration to produce more Solarian Influence. I am not going to get an agent very quickly. It's going to be uh, a, a, a bit of time until I have an agent. So Intelligence Network is not generally wise to initially research because you're not going to immediately benefit from it. Uh, survival chain Training does unlock the military bi base building, but you can't, um, you're probably not going to use a military base early on uh, because military base is what they do is they will strengthen the units in the region that a military base is built, and then all of the adjacent regions. But where you start is generally not going to be a battleground because the opponents are so far out of your territory that there's really no need for a military base early on. It also unlocks the sniper unit. For other factions, there's going to be some other kind of unit that it will be called. The research trees more or less are, I would say, about 80% the same between each faction. The Fremen are a little bit more unique, but... Um, so survival training isn't really needed early on, but I will say that um, early mid game, you're going to need a lot of the combat because if you don't and you fall behind, the enemy units are going to smoke you. And then down here is composite materials, which reduces the construction cost, which is really nice to have. So generally what I do is local dialect studies and then go to composite materials afterwards. And as you can see, they're now queued up. So in five days, I will have local dialect studies. And then after 10 days, I'll have com uh, composite materials. I'm going to have these troops hang out here to heal now that I'm in an allied village and you'll see that my scavenger here is starting to regen health. Another thing I could do, which will help me to scout faster. Oh, interesting. It's a black market. Okay. Um, so that means that Burha here doesn't actually have any natural resources. 
It has high wind, which might be nice, and it has some manpower, but it doesn't have things like spice or minerals, not all regions do. So while I'm waiting for my scavenger to heal up, I'm actually gonna send my wrecker out to walk to adjacent map tiles to help scout. Now your individual units do have a finite amount of supplies. So you, if you use your units like this, you really have to pay attention to what they're doing because you can get them endangered Let's pretty quickly move. and have them die. And the next region I'm probably going to be hitting up is Arcta for the Plaskrete factory that it can pr provide. So let's build the refinery. I should have done that already. So this refinery, and let me go over all of buildings. So there are economic, military, and statecraft buildings. Uh, you will often have quests to be able to, or force you to build one of these buildings. Um, so I'm building a refinery, which allows me to start harvesting the spice. And the tutorial here is going to basically tell me to do that. But there we go. First refinery. Uh, you have a finite amount of building slots. And you unlock additional building slots up to five. There's some special scenarios where you can go above five. But up to five with additional plascrete. And then you also have militia. Militia are units that you don't actually directly control. But they pop out of the village. They're armed civilians. And they help to defend the towns. So the border territories that you have next to your opponents or territories that you think are going to get attacked by opponents or also by um, enemy sieges, which are independent uh, factions that don't own territory, but they will send out rebels and uh, to attack you, uh, you can make militia. Now, I'm not going to make militia for Harasek here because I don't think Harasek's going to be on the front lines of any battles. And if it is, I can use my own troops instead. Engine's hot. All right, let's see. This is another region for me to scout out at some point. So what I did is I just stepped a little foot into the region just to reveal it, and then it came back into my own territory so my supplies doesn't get wrecked. Because marching across a region like that is gonna wreck my supplies. And there it is, that's the home of the region. So the next region I wanna just stick my foot into is this one figuring out what resources are in here. And as you can see, I'm pretty close to the edge of the map. Like this here is the edge of the map. So if I control this region, um, it would be challenging for enemies to get to Harasek because they'd have to march all the way across, uh, which means that I would have increased time to be able to react to their troops and they would be running out of resources and supplies uh, on somewhat of a okay. death march. Let's go then. All right, the region down here is a scavenger network. I really like scavenger network uh, regions. So what this does is I gain extra money, Solari, anytime an enemy unit dies in my territory. Uh, so owning this region actually gives me the scavenger network for all of my territory. So anytime I am defending my territory, I gain money for kills, which is pretty fantastic. It's a lot of money. What do you need? All right, I'm positioning my scavenger over here to attack Arcta, because I think Arcta is going to be my next annexed territory. Oh, yes. And then this scavenger here is... There are, this recon here is going to keep searching. Hello. And here is Mirror Basin. Nice. All right, here is spice production. Uh, it's telling me to build a refinery and to send my ship or my harvester, my spice harvester out to the field. So the refinery is currently being constructed. Yeah, what? There's no rush, right? All right this region has handyman. Um, building is faster and cheaper, but only for this region so not that likely that uh, this is high up on my list unless it has natural resources that are enticing. You asked for chemical experts. The two defenders here are both militia. Yeah, we're going. Not that it makes much of a difference because generally speaking, your own troops are going to outclass armed civilians. So if it's an even fight or even if it's a 2v3, 
your yeah, own troops are gonna win. Not. One thing to note is that the supplies of this wrecker is getting pretty low because they had to walk all the way around. But I think it's high enough that they're not gonna yeah. suffer any death or anything like that. So here we go. Into the next fight. It is giving me a little bit of a red warning here that the wrecker has low supplies, but like I said, I don't think that they're going to be um, endangered. So this region here does have rare elements. Rare elements allows you to build a processing plant to be able to harvest those rare elements and sell them for Solari. And then also the construction of a crafts workshop, which is a special building, which periodically adds to your hegemony. I'm looking very closely at this wrecker's uh, supplies. Should be fine. All right, I'm about to get my first research. So for me to be able to use this rare elements, I'm going to need to unlock a processor plant, which is in the underworld contracts tree. Gain more Solari when pillaging a village, uh, gain Solari per Underworld Headquarter, and also unlocks the Processing Plant building. So I'm going to queue that up. So I'll go Local Dialects, Composite Materials, Underworld Contracts. Alright, my Harvester is built, and I'm going to deploy it. So Carryall is going to go pick up the Harvester and bring him to the Spice Field. Um... Every now and then, due to the vibrations of the harvester, it will attract a dune worm. Uh, you can enable the auto recall to be able to pull the harvester back automatically. But what I will say is, even with the auto recall on, your harvester can still get destroyed by dune worms. But with auto recall on, you produce less spice, so I leave it off. I just manage it myself. And let's send my recon out here. Uh. Actually, I'm going to send them to this region here, because I think this region is closer to my my home siege, because it is proximity that matters most. Fruity, thank you for the sub. Another thing is, if you have 50 um, manpower, you can also add crew to the harvester uh, to be able to produce more spice per harvester. And then there is research down here, modular parts, Rydex plane and crew training program, which allows you to increase your crews more and more and more. And every faction has ways to increase crew size. All right, so my wrecker here is losing health due to the fact that they have low supplies. So I'm going to send the wrecker back into my own territory for them to heal up. And then I just finished the local dialect studies. Which means that when I annex this territory here, Arcta, I reduce the amount of authority needed by six for the research of local dialect studies and then one by water perf perfusion. Done. Right. All right, up here in Harasek, there is a free building spot and I'm going to build a Plascrete factory. You can only build on the hardened rock here. You cannot build on sand. Some regions are all hardened rock, so the center region is all hardened rock where you can build anywhere. And then other regions that you can find randomly will also have the hardened rock, but you have to construct um, somewhere on the grid that is protected by dune worms. Another thing to note is there are certain buildings that shoot like missiles at enemies. So if you have a bunch of regions with all cities around one another, um, like let's imagine that uh, Arcta, it was over here. I could build like a missile silo here, a missile silo here, and like a missile silo, you know, in a third region. And all three missile silos would help cover one another, which makes all three regions very difficult to attack and control. It's a pretty useful tool. Right. Yeah, what? Great. Oops. You stay there. All right, so I'm building the Plascrete factory over here because my Plascrete income is now only plus six. So I need a Plascrete factory to be able to um, keep building and supplying. The two big resources you're gonna need to manage is Solari and Plascrete. Over here, there's a slider. 
And let me explain this slider now that I have a little bit of spice. My spice income is 20 per day. And this slider allows me to designate where that spice goes. I can either sell it to Chome or I can stockpile it for the Imperial Bride. So if you need a lot of money, you can drag this all the way down and you'll, as you can see, my salary has gone up. Chome sales plus 40. Or if I needed to stockpile a lot of it for the Imperial Bribes, I could slide this all the way up and now I stockpile all of it. I usually leave it somewhere in the middle. It's also important to note that um, you can make more money selling spice depending on your reputation with Chome and uh, research technologies that you've unlocked and other things. So there are, it's not a constant exchange rate. As you can see, it uh, it's an exchange rate that varies quite a lot. Um, and another thing that I could show is like if I drag this down, it will calculate the current expected stocks for next tax. So at 80% selling to Chome and 20% stockpiling, or no, 70-30, it expects that I'll have 91 spice by the time next tax rolls around. So it actually does the calculations for you automatically. So if I go to 80-10, I won't have enough, or 80-20. If I go to 70-30, I will have enough. Really early on, it's generally pretty nice to have a lot of Solari on hand for you to be able to pay for things and buy things. So initially, I'm going to try to min-max it so that I sell most of my spice to Chome uh, so that I can reinvest those resources and expand the empire. And there is, I think, the last of the tutorial right there. All right, so the next territory that I'm likely to grab maybe is Esha. Esha cost me 41 authority, which isn't bad. It's 44 for here, 47 for here. And then up here will be even more. And then Esha also has the rare elements, which will be able to add to my Solari income as well. And I'll be able to exploit those materials as soon as I get Underworld Contracts. So it will be about five days for composite materials and then nine days for Underworld Contracts. So I won't be able to initially and immediately uh, use these rare elements, uh, but they will come into play pretty shortly thereafter. And here we go in Arcta. And here's a little bit of a warning. So, the more villages and military units you control, the more water I will need. If available water is negative, it will lead to unrest. So, build wind traps to gather water. Especially in regions with high wind. So this region here, I'm actually going to ignore them. I'm going to build a Plascrete factory. Because it is a Plascrete factory region. But then the next building I build here will be a wind trap. And wind traps collect three water per wind. So the wind in this region is three, so I'll get nine water for a wind trap in Arcta. Uh, up here, I would get 15. Here I would get another 15. Not all regions are the same, but a lot of the regions that surround me have pretty high wind, so that's that's good. Uh, false, false Wall South has a wind of four, so I get at least 12. Let's get going. Now that my manpower has hit above 50, I'm going to add crew to this harvester to increase my spice production from 20 to 25, which of course is going to change the calculation of how much spice I'm going to have for the Imperial tax, but I'm actually going to leave it at 70-30 because it's not bad to have a little stockpile of spice. You can use it to trade with other factions for things that you need, like Plascrete or Solari, um, and you can also use spice to sell. So over here in the black market, I can sell spice for Solari on the black market through these... Um, these special little things. And, and let me explain the map now that I have more information. So here you is the harvester filter. So my one harvester shows up here. Then here is the resources. Spice, minerals, rare elements. Over here is the villages and who controls them. So independent, 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 mine and mine. And then here is the scouting filter. So there are different things to scout. Some things have you interact. So for this black market, for instance, I can either buy spice or sell spice, and that will then resolve the little incident. You can think of these, if you're familiar with uh, Stellaris, as like anomalies. They're basically a Stellaris anomalies. So this anomaly, for instance, it's supposed to be the shape of a, a downed ship or mortar shell. It's a crashed shuttle. And if I analyze this, 
I will gain a little bit of military development. So these are really, really important to do very early on if you want to jumpstart to your research tree. You only are able to do these as soon as you get your first espionage agent, though. So I'm going to be ignoring most of these little scouting elements until I have that initial agent. And then I'll be able to show you the espionage menu and how to use it and how to interact with it and what it does. And then you can also show your armies. And then the last one is your airfields. Uh, airfields are a little bit different for the Fremen. They actually don't have airfields. They ride worms with thumpers and it's kind of hard to use. But uh, the way airfields work is you can use fuel cells to construct airfields at any village. It counts as a building. And then it will create this same size circle around the village, wherever you place the airfield, and you can pay Solari to have troops picked up and dropped off to any airfield. So if you, like let's say had an airfield out here, I could say, hey, I want my wrecker to shuttle out to there. It, it isn't instant, it does take time, but it's a really good way to travel long distances because when an enemy army is like invading your villages or coming into your territory, units move really slow. I'm sure you've noticed that, that like this wrecker here, it, not exactly speedy. So um, as a result of that, uh, what, what you're able to do is to react as long as you have a good airfield network in your empire, you can have a small but solid army to jump around to where they're needed rather than to have standing armies kind of everywhere. And that will lower your cost tremendously. Hello. Need something, Chief? Can't we take the shuttle? All right, so another thing that I wanted to mention is that I have the counselor, which increases the pillaging I get from pillaging villages and also gains Palascrete by pillaging villages. So one of the things I might want to do is pillage a village around me. Now, when you pillage a village, it also increases the authority it requires to annex it later on so I probably don't want to pillage Esha. Additionally, when you pillage a village, uh, it will go on a cooldown where no one can interact with it for a period of time. So you can't just re-pillage it over and over and over again. Again, if, if like I rolled up on an enemy territory and I liberated it, they couldn't re-annex it until that cooldown time is over. So anytime you interact, you either pillage or annex or, or, um, uh, or whatever to a village, there is a bit of a cooldown timer of when the next action can be taken. So if I wanted to pillage, uh, I think an obvious pillage would be um, this here. Well, no, that has the Solari network, Scav network. I'll see what this village is over here. That's not a siege. Copy. That is another rare elements. I'll probably send send my guys over to Burha to pillage it. Does the extra authority cost stack on multiple raids? Uh, it depends on your tech level and research. So there are some researches that uh, reduces, let me see if I can find one, that reduces the penalty to um, additional, or to pillaging. Um, so yeah, it varies. I don't know if the, um, the smugglers have such a, uh, a research. I don't have them memorized. But I know that um, some factions can remove your pillaging um, penalties. Alright, let me let me wait until my scavenger is all the way healed before Ready sending them out. What do you want? Alright, 400, and we're good to go. So you can see up here the Imperial bribe ticking away. Yes, boss. Yes. And now combat ongoing. It's two snipers, so I will wrap them up in melee combat, reduce the amount of damage that they do. And I'm about to get my first agent, so I'll be able to show you the espionage mechanics. Yes, boss. Just a second. All right, construction is complete. I now have the Plascrete factory up here, so my Plascrete income has gone up. And then I all can also spend 100 Plascrete to unlock another building slot. I don't have that at the moment, but I will soon. Thank you for tuning in to Dune Spice Wars. If you have any feedback or questions for me, let me know in the comments below.
If you would like to catch live streams of mine, Rodamont.com has my stream schedule and countdown timers to upcoming streams. If you'd like to join my gaming community, Rodamont.com or the description of this video have a link to Discord. Thank you so very much for watching. A special thank you to my Patreon patrons, Twitch subscribers, and viewers like you that support the channel. I'll catch you next episode or an upcoming stream. Farewell, my fellow Dune smugglers.